Christmas decorations are about all put away now, but I will confess to having a few lingering holiday cards still around. The family faces on so many of the cards are all so beautiful. The children are, well, picture perfect. Holiday cards capture them in their youth, freezing them in time and in a particular place. I further confess that I only reluctantly return to the basement the Christmas photo I display each year of my own now 30-something-year-old sons when the youngest was just a year old, his first Christmas what interesting men they have grown up to be. And for those of you who know them, enough said. <laughs> Even here at the church, we finally moved all the holiday finery out. For some of us, the candlelit memories and the numinous worship of Christmas Eve still resonates. Can we even stand it that time has moved so quickly? Christmas Eve was only three and a half weeks ago. Can we now only with some effort still remember the beauty of the purple paraments that indicated we were in the season of Advent right before Christmas, waiting for the Christ child's birth? Then for the last three weeks, we enjoyed the white celebratory clergy stoles and white paraments acknowledging Christmas tide, Epiphany, and the baptism of the Lord Sunday. The Gospel reading last Sunday reminded us that when John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan, Jesus was recognized as God's Son, the Messiah, in whom God is well pleased. And Jesus' ministry, his call to service, was off and running. Last Sunday was extraordinary, too, because we heard words of a fiery sermon powerfully delivered by the legendary Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Well, this time, this week, this Sunday, all is quite different. We might say ordinary. Beside the fact that I'm preaching, we've entered ordinary time in the liturgical calendar of the year. In ordinary time, our lectionary passages move us from the wonders and mysteries of Christ's incarnation, his joining us in human form, to the focus on the miracles and message of Christ's life as he fulfilled the law and the prophets of the Old Testament and brought the good news of the gospel into a hurting world. Our pyramids and stoles are now green, indicating this ordinary time focus in which we will stay until Ash Wednesday that heralds Lent and that in-between time that leads up to our remembrance of Christ's love, passion, and resurrection at Easter. So as we recognize all these in-between times in the church liturgical calendar, let's go back and pick up another important in-between time from the Old Testament and see who God is, was, then, how God acted in the world, and who God called Samuel to be as God's agent in the world. Today's Old Testament story is set in the time between the time that Israel was judged by, was uh, led and ruled by judges and the time that there were kings in Israel. Now there's a prime minister in Israel, but that complicated story is one for history in the daily news and not a part of this sermon, thanks be to God. You heard me read the call story of Samuel as the story is ordinarily described. God is both literally calling Samuel and calling him to a particular service to God as a prophet and a leader. I have to admit that as intriguing and often dramatic as biblical call stories can be, think for instance of St. Paul's Damascus Road story, you know, the experience he had being knocked flat and blinded for three days, and like Samuel, heard a voice that changed his life and the life of a whole lot of Hebrews and Gentiles. No, it is the transitional in-between time of the story setting today that most drew my attention when I encountered the story again. But what about the storyline of the Samuel text? Well, it's definitely a dramatic story, although it has some quirks. There are three main characters, Eli, Samuel, and God. And there is a turn of fate for the two humans. The old priest, Eli, who's going to find out he's done for. And the young, up-and-coming prophet and kingmaker, Samuel, who would go on to anoint both Saul and David as kings of Israel and have some hard times in his ministry, too. 
There is a theophany, which means an experience of the presence of God in the human world, which the story tells us was pretty rare in those days. And there was God's voice and the announcement that the new thing God was going to do was going to be able to tingle both ears of those who would hear it. This God is not tame. There will be a physicality. Eli and his family will be punished. The hearers of this scripture will know something extraordinary is happening. One commentator actually warns us against an easy domestication of this story through the appeal of the character of Samuel, a naive child, and his tender relationship with a fading but flawed church leader, Eli, who has been the child's erstwhile parent since the child was weaned by his mother, Hannah, who had suffered years of childlessness and cultural shame before she prayed dramatically in the temple, vowing to God that if God would only give her a son, she would set before God that child in service to God his whole life long. The old priest Eli heard her temple prayer and prophesied that the God of Israel would grant her her petition. He was right. It was granted. And Hannah did make good on her vow, bringing the weanling boy, Samuel, to Eli the priest and into the service of God. Eli's vocation in life had been determined. I wonder about Hannah's in-between time when she finally conceived, when the pregnancy progressed and her belly grew large, and near the time of the child's birth when she could find no comfortable sleeping position, did her gratefulness to God hold? Was she perhaps a little frightened? Did she maintain her resolve to carry through with her promise to give up this child she had so long waited for? In between time, this weekend is a national holiday weekend when we as a nation honor the birthday of the slain civil rights leader and Nobel Peace Prize winner, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I went to see the movie Selma earlier this week, and as I was thinking about the scripture from Samuel, and as I was thinking about where we are as a church in between pastors, the scene for the movie grabbed my attention either from the movie or personal memory or from your study of American history in school, you may know that there were three marches in Selma in 1965 organized to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The first one was dreadful. People were hurt badly. Afterward, they would call that March day Bloody Sunday. In the movie, the portrayal of the second march was quite different. Dr. King led the march, and he stopped the mass of marchers partway across that famous bridge. Tension built. The cameras switched dramatically back and forth from the faces of Dr. King and the marchers to the armed officers and crowd gathered on the other side of the river. What Dr. King did next quietly shouted his faith. He knelt. He prayed. He listened. He sought God's voice. Did his ears, both his ears, tingle in anticipation of what new thing God was about to do? Dr. King stood up after his prayer on that bridge and sent the marchers back to where they had begun. They did not go forward that day. I doubt that any of us here today were there that day, but do you know who was almost there? Rabbi Miller, not our rabbi, Jonathan Miller of Temper Emmanuel, you know that Jewish temple around on Highland Avenue where IBC was birthed and from which it was weaned to this sanctuary in service to the one God. No, not Rabbi Jonathan Miller, but his dad, Rabbi Judea Miller. Jonathan shared with some of us his Friday night sermon entitled Selma. And I quote now from that fine sermon. For me, the movie Selma, this was a personal story. In March 1965, I was 10 years old. My sister had just turned seven. 
We were used to our father, Rabbi Judea Miller, leaving home for two weeks to make his way to Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama to engage in nonviolent desegregation drives to integrate lunch counters and public facilities and to register African American voters. He did this in 1963 and in 1964. His congregation in Wichita, Kansas had a bail fund for him. My father actually spent a night in the Hattiesburg jail. He was thrilled to be there because he thought that if he were on the street in Hattiesburg, he would have been killed. In our town in Wichita, he was involved in racial justice, reconciliation, and fair housing for black people. He was a marvelous rabbi, but I assume that a fair section of his congregation deeply resented his activities on behalf of others, especially black folks. Why on earth should this have been a concern to this young rabbi from the Bronx, then 33 years old, with two children and a stay-at-home wife? Take care of the congregation must have been a buzz about town. You don't have to be doing this. This is not what we pay you for. And with little children, what on earth are we going to do if you get hurt or killed? Who's going to take care of them? I've been involved in congregational life as a son of a rabbi, as a rabbi myself, and as a father of a rabbi, and I know the way congregations think. Temple Emmanuel in Wichita, Kansas, was so proud of my dad, and they were so annoyed with him, too. He had to live with that, and it couldn't have been easy. End quote. Jonathan goes on to recount that when he moved to Birmingham to serve his congregation here, his parents came to visit, and his dad, the old rabbi, took what Jonathan called a pilgrimage to the 16th Street Baptist Church and to Kelly Ingram Park. Jonathan's mother explained to her grandchildren that the grandfather did what he did when he was younger, protesting hatred and injustice, so that they and their parents could live in Alabama together more safely. After Jonathan saw the movie, he called his mother and asked her if his father had ever thought of going to Selma with Dr. King. That would have been the rabbi's third trip down south. He said her voice changed on the phone, and she said, he wanted to go, but I couldn't let him. I couldn't do it again. God bless her, and God bless the rabbis Miller. In between times, we are still, sadly, in between the time of the realized reconciliation and justice for all that God would have and the injustices we have not completely righted. God calls us still to keep seeking him and his justice in the world. Well. What is IPC doing in its in-between time? Our extraordinary, ordinary time in between pastors. Quite a bit, actually. In addition to the ongoing work of our pastor nominating committee, many programs and departments are quite active. I took notes at our weekly staff meeting and shared just a couple of the uh, reports and announcements from that meeting. Friday a week ago, our IPC youth program hosted an evening called Radiate, where 11,000 meals for hungry people were packed in an hour by about 160 girls and their moms right next door in 3116. I urge you to see last week's Thursday e-update for the photos and more details of what else they did that night to grow their faith in Christ and in the work of Christ in the world through the church, and through their very lives. Later that weekend, other youth were here too, as IPC hosted the Presbytery's Youth Council. Earlier last week, the Presbytery's Executive Council held their January retreat at the Children's Fresh Air Farm. IPC is a hospitable, welcoming place. An update on the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd program for our younger children noted how energizing this Christian education program has been. The number of children who come regularly is solid, and the way visiting children easily fall into the space, the lessons, the fellowship with the other children and the teachers, who are called catechists, is heartening. The parents of these children in Atrium 1 and Atrium 2 are able to enjoy faith enrichment and community building through the Seekers Sunday School class that meets upstairs while the kids are downstairs in the atria. 
In just this term, our day school students are now beginning to come to the atria during the week to experience this faith-forming and enriching program here at IPC. Having Dr. Brueggemann here last Sunday, not only in the morning worship, but also for Sunday evening's uh, worship service, drew another crowd of visitors to IPC. We are busy. We are invigorated to be God's servants in this time and in this place. There are sparks of creativity, good ideas, and a generative spirit of cooperation in these in-between times at IPC. And we are listening because we want to be ready to hear when God calls. Let's be clear about something. God never called or sent us a pastor who was not human. Every one of them blessed us and not a one of them was perfect. Not even Dr. Walter Brueggemann, who drew both much praise and a bit of criticism as well. But God knows us, individually by name and as a church, like God knew Samuel, Eli, Philip, Nathaniel, the Shiloh Temple, and all the synagogues that Jesus visited. And we can be confident that God knows what God is doing. In our gospel reading, Jesus calls Philip, follow me, Jesus says. Philip finds Nathanael and tells him the law and the prophets have been fulfilled in Jesus and come and see. Nathanael asks Jesus, how did you know me? After Jesus answers, Nathanael gets up and exclaims, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Rabbis, sons, and kings. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God who was in the beginning is now and ever shall be. In the former times, in the in-between times, and until the end of time, when all is reconciled in service to God and God's kingdom. Let the church's response to God's call be, Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Will you pray with me again? Now to the one who, by the power at work within us, is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.